All right, well, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on bunions, causes, and treatment options. My name is Megan Noe. I'm with MU Healthcare, and I will be here to help make sure you get all of your questions answered uh, this afternoon. You can submit those questions if you have any during the presentation by using that Q&A button that should be at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you'll see that you can type your questions in, and then uh, we're going to answer those at the end of the presentation. So stick around and we will try and get to all of your questions. But uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our experts who will be leading today's presentation. We have Dr. Kyle Fiala, Dr. Benjamin Summerhays, and Dr. Kyle Schwazer. They are all physicians at MU Healthcare's Missouri Orthopedic Institute. And with that, I will turn this over to them. Gentlemen. Perfect. Thanks, Megan. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining on this webinar. It's definitely uh, you know, challenging and, and crazy times. And usually we do these in person. So this kind of Zoom webinar format's a little bit new. And I see a few familiar names on the participant list. So maybe we'll get to talk to some of those later. Uh, but um, we're going to talk about bunions today and kind of just give a brief overview of things and um, we're looking forward to it. So we can start that first slide. So our agenda for today is we're just going to kind of review kind of what a bunion deformity is. We're going to kind of review how a bunion is diagnosed. We're going to cover some traditional uh, treatment methods and then kind of there's some newer uh, uh, treatment options and kind of a newer philosophy of how we go about treating uh, bunions, which we will cover extensively, and then kind of periodically we will kind of uh, address some safety uh, measures throughout this uh, talk. So the true medical term for what a bunion is, is this term called hallux abducto valgus. So that just basically is kind of describes what this the big toe is doing, and it, it's it's more of a terminology term, but what most people think of is, is bunions, and it's a very common complaint um, in kind of the foot world and foot clinic. Uh, that is something that we see every day and a lot of times patients come in and they they just kind of want a, an idea of uh, or an understanding of what it is and, and and some just generalized information or sometimes it is very symptomatic and very painful and so um, it's, it's something very very common that we see every day um, there's a lot of myths and a lot of bad information out there and so hopefully throughout this little webinar that we will dispel some of that uh, if you talk to a friend a neighbor a family member that's had you know either something done or had you have this, there's, you're going to get varying degrees of, of their experience and, and, and some information. So hopefully we can clear that up. Um, treatment can be confusing and, and there's again a lot of myths out there. And um, with these newer treatment options, it's really kind of challenging um, the traditional approach to how we treat this. So as far as bunions go, they're actually really, really common. Um, the estimated prevalence is anywhere between about 23 to 35 percent of the population uh, uh, suffer as a bunion or has a bunion. Um, there is a definite higher percentage of uh, female patients uh, compared to males. Um, that's just kind of what we see in the literature. It's probably maybe more equal, but men tend to, to you know, wear a little bit wider shoes or maybe they don't want to go to the, the doctor or physician as much as maybe uh, female patients do. So we, we do see a little bit of a higher rate in females. Um, there is a little bit of a higher incidence in patients over 65, but we do see uh, patients that have these um, through all age ranges. So uh, we can see patients as young as 8, 9, 10 have a bunion, and we can see patients all the way up to 80 or 90 that have these. So there's a wide spectrum. Um, and then it is, it is common, and there's about 200,000 bunionectomies performed every year. So you know, for a certain percentage of patients, it is symptomatic, and it is uh, painful enough that they, they elect to pursue uh, surgical treatment for it. So we get this asked a lot, um, and this slide I think really does a good job of kind of explaining kind of what a bunion is. And if you can tell by those arrows, uh, there's two arrows there. Uh, the first one is pointing towards this big prominence over the big toe. That is classically what, what we would term a bunion. So it's a skeletal deformity, which we'll get into, and um, it's not a growth, it's not a, a, a calcium deposit. That's actually a deviation of the bone. And what happens with this is the metatarsal starts kind of going out towards the left there. And there's no counterbalancing of the, of the big toe there. So the big toe kind of goes in the opposite direction and that forms that big, big prominence there. And uh, interesting enough, you can also get what's called a bunionette. And that's what that arrow is on the right there. And that's kind of pointing over the fifth metatarsal head. 
Um, and so that's kind of what we call like a, a, a teeny bunion or a bunionette. Um, and that can be equally asymptomatic, but for our talk today, we're gonna kind of talk about the, 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 the classic bunion. So a lot of patients will come in and they'll, we get this asked all the time is, why do we get bunions? And the, the true correct answer is, is it's kind of unknown. Um, there's a lot of theories out there. Um, there's a lot of um, you know, ideas and thoughts, but it's, it's largely probably multifactorial. It's a combination of a lot of, uh, of different things of why patients get this. So some of the ones could be genetics. So um, you know, either juvenile, we see this in, in kids that are born that have never really worn shoes or um, you know, it's uh, maybe in kind of indigenous tribes that have never worn shoes. It's, you know, there's a genetic component to it. So I always tell patients that you know, it's, it's not a gene that's passed 100% of the time, uh, but I do feel like that there is a, a genetic component to it. Um, certainly external factors like poor uh, fitting shoes like on the slide on the, the, the right there. Most modern Western style shoes have a very narrow toe box and so they will taper down at the toes. And so if you're genetically predisposed to having a bunion and you wear kind of more of these, these uh, uh, Western style shoes, um, you know, it's gonna increase the chance that, that you're gonna have a bunion or that it could make it worse. Um, and then there's also kind of natural factors too, such as maybe the, the anatomy, maybe it's the metatarsal length, maybe it's too long or too short, maybe it's the metatarsal head, it's more rounded versus square, um, or soft tissue imbalances. So patients that undergo, like, or let's say they have a stroke, that's gonna affect how the muscles work in the foot. And so certain things are gonna have to work harder or different than the other. And so that can maybe lead to a bunion or um, some patients that have a neuromuscular uh, uh, disease, maybe such as like cerebral palsy, where it affects the muscle tone and, and the, the balance in the foot, it can cause that. So, but the exact cause is really kind of unknown. We don't, you know, I think it's a combination of a lot of different things. So this is kind of what we initially look at here. And, and the x-ray on the left is kind of a normal x-ray and x-ray on the right is a, is a patient that has a, a, an issue here. And so I'm gonna transition this part of the talk over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Summer Hayes, and let him kind of uh, chime in here on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for uh, tuning in. And uh, we love feet uh, and it's an interesting topic for us, um, but bunions are, one of the most common things um, that we see each day um, for a wide range of patients from younger to older, just like Dr. Fiala had mentioned. Um, and you can take a look at somebody, whether you're looking at them out of the pool or, or someone else, and you can say, boy, that just doesn't look straight. Or, you know, that bone prominence, uh, it, you know, that doesn't look right. Um, and sometimes you can compare both feet and one foot might look a little bit different than the other foot. Well, in x-ray, just like the picture that we're looking at on the right, if you look at that big toe, you'll see those two little circles underneath that joint. Those are normal. It's kind of like a small kneecap. They're about the size of an M&M. &M. And we can say that, okay, the tendons that help attach and help that toe function now are offset. Where if we look at the picture on the left, we can see that those two little circles are lined up right in the middle across that joint. And so the bunion, we can see the deviation or where that big toe just starts to push towards just like dominoes falling, pushing towards that second toe. And with life and time and of decades, um, we'll see that that joint starts to get a little bit more dislocated. And that's when people usually say, um, oh yeah, you know, this, this has gotten a lot bigger or um, you know, they're a really big calcium deposit. And like Dr. Fiala had mentioned prior, the area of the joint doesn't grow extra bone typically. It might have some extra spurs from some arthritis, um, but it wouldn't be growing a lot more bone. And with this x-ray, we can see the alignment. We can see how dense the bone looks, the alignment of the bone, and arthritis, which would be really the cartilage and the joint surface, we can see sometimes more narrowing across the joint. And so the x-ray is a really helpful tool that we have that's really easy to take in the office um, at the time of the appointment so that we can look at it together um, and really make that determination and also with our clinical exam. And so making the diagnosis, you know, sometimes it doesn't take a foot doctor to say, hey, that's a bunion. Um, but certain things are very helpful for us to examine you in person. So the x-ray is very helpful for us to see that alignment, how good the bone looks, how much cartilage is there, 
Um, but really evaluating that alignment um, is, is the number one thing. And having people stand uh, and standing during x-rays is really helpful because it's one thing if you take an x-ray of a foot and you're not standing on it. It's another to see what does your foot look like as it opens up more. Sometimes people's feet widen as they stand, as the bones then just start to separate and kind of really unmask their um, overall appearance of what it would be in the shoe. Um, and not all shoes, like Dr. Fiala said, are, are made for every feet. I mean, they're, they're made for a look, uh, they're made for a function, um, but a lot of them can't accommodate for some people who just have a wider foot. So there's a lot of different things uh, as a foot and ankle doctor uh, that we do to look at alignment. And we can say, you know, this bone in relation to the other bone, so the picture on the left with that V-shaped area, that's our, I call it the peace sign. Well, that peace sign, the kind of that bigger, that peace sign opens up, then the bigger the separation, the bigger the bunion, the bigger the bunion might would change the potential procedure that we would do. Um, we might have to add another procedure. And so it's really helpful for us to have these kind of normals, but then look at the other um, relation of the, the separation, the width uh, between the bones, then make the determination of how we're gonna correct this um, and, and really severe, or see how severe um, that that x-ray is on a person. So we also look at those little M&Ms I was talking about, those sesamoids. And so with life and time, they can wear away their helping tendons function to keep the big toe down on the ground. And so we can obtain different x-rays that help us look at that alignment. And we can see just like somebody of a mechanic working on your car and say your toe or your tire alignments are um, similar to your toe. If the toe is off a line, then that's going to wear out faster um, and be less functional overall. In comparing these, we can see the one on the left looks more centered where those sesamoids, those bones um, under that larger bone on the left-hand side are right in the middle. Where we can see the picture at the top right and the picture on the bottom right, the difference between those. And those are patients standing there. And some people have a bigger deformity. Some people have more long-standing deformity. And so with things in life and time, that bunion will become more crooked, more deformed and, and more arthritic and, and likely more painful. Um, and so that just gives us a good picture of, of how those little sesamoids uh, move and help the big toe function. And so I'm gonna transition over to Dr. Kyle Schwazer uh, to talk about different ways that we treat our bunions. Thanks, Kyle, thanks, Ben. Uh, so when we're considering treatment for bunions, it's essentially split up into two categories. And we have conservative treatment, which is no surgery. And then we have surgical treatment. Conservative treatment is all about uh, symptomatic treatment. So we're just trying to treat your symptoms. Um, you can't really long-term correct your deformity and we can't fix your deformity without surgery. Um, but there are things that we can do to maybe help the symptoms that you're having, like the pain that you're having or the problems with shoes. Um, so we can modify your shoes, we can make them wider. We can include little recesses in your shoe to allow that, that bunion that you have, the, the bony prominence to kind of sit into that space to prevent your shoe from rubbing on the skin. Because part of the problem uh, and part of the pain that people have from bunions is actually with their shoes and it's rubbing on that area. Arthritis is also a problem. There's other issues, but that's one of the things that we can potentially control. And that's with either shoe wear modification or pads. There are orthotics and splints that you can use, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, and then we usually prescribe anti-inflammatory. So Advil, Aleve, or prescription strength um, anti-inflammatories to help with some of the pain control. So orthotics. Um, so typically orthotics uh, are given if we can correct your deformity. So what does that mean? Well, when we examine you in clinic, can we make your big toe straight by just manipulating it? If we can do that, then an orthotic can help um, in terms of improving the position of your toe. So if you're not having a lot of pain, um, but the problem is maybe you're having difficulty with getting into shoes because of the shape of your toe, you can get an orthotic that'll help align your, um, your big toe. Now these don't correct it over time, so this is not gonna make it better, um, but there are a few studies that show it can maybe slow progression of your deformity, so it can maybe 
slow it down from getting worse. Um, but it's mixed on whether it controls your pain or not. Uh, and then most studies show that surgery does do better than orthotics for symptomatic bunions. And then splinting is, uh, again, for correctable deformities. Most people will wear these at night. And again, it's pain control, right? So it, it only works when it's on. So when you put the splint on, it can correct the shape of your foot. But when you take it off, that deformity tends to return. There's not a whole lot of evidence that these help anything, but they certainly don't hurt. So if you want to try it, you can. And if it makes you feel better, then that's great. Uh, but don't expect it to... Um, to kind of fix your bunion, you know, in one year, you're still going to be wearing the splint. It's not going to make your toe straight long term. So then we get into surgical treatment. So the only time we ever do surgery is for painful bunions uh, or problems with shoe wear. So is your bunion so bad that it's that your big toe is going underneath your second toe and causing that to pop up and you can't wear shoes because of it and it's starting to create ulcers or starting to rub areas on your skin, it's causing a lot of pain, that's when we do surgery. It is not for cosmetic reasons. So uh, if you come in and just don't like the way that your foot looks, we're not typically going to recommend surgery. And the reason for that is because we can certainly make you worse with, with surgery. So you could come in with a bunion that you don't like how it looks, but you're not having pain. And then we do surgery and now you have pain. So we only really do surgery if you're symptomatic. There's a lot of different surgical procedures uh, for bunions. There's about 150 different procedures described. So what does that mean? Well, it's a mix, it's kind of because of several reasons. Uh, one of those is because the level of your deformity or how, how much correction you need can change where we do um, certain cuts in the bone. Um, you can combine different procedures, but part of it is that we don't, maybe we don't understand fully, at least originally, how to correct these deformities. So a bunch of different people were coming up with a bunch of different ways to correct it um, because we didn't have the best answer. And there's four different types of surgery. So most people will say, I, you know, I have, I got a bunionectomy to describe the correction of their bunion, but a bunionectomy is typically just removing a part of your bone. Um, you can cut the bone and realign it, which is called an osteotomy. You can fuse some joints, that's called an arthrodesis. And what you're trying to do there is get the two ends of the joint, you're removing the cartilage and, and getting the two ends to grow together to make one solid bone so that there's no more movement in that joint. And then there's some soft tissue realigning where you can cut tendons, realign tendons, um, you can uh, uh, tighten the joint capsule, things like that. It's, and there's a lot of times it's a combination of these when we talk about surgical treatment. Uh, so this is a true bunionectomy. It's where you remove just that outer part of the bone. Um, you're typically removing it from what's called the metatarsal head. So the metatarsal is that long bone um, that we're trying to correct because we're actually not typically moving your big toe. We're correcting the, the bone that's attached to it. That's how we're correcting the shape of your toe. Um, this is not typically done by itself. So it can be done as part of a procedure but it's not done by itself and it does not correct the underlying deformity. So then there's soft tissue correction. So we're releasing the soft tissue around the joint, um, trying to realign it that way. This particular picture is a, something called a McBride or a modified McBride. And um, it's usually done, soft tissue procedures are usually done in combination with other procedures like osteotomies. Um, they are not typically done in isolation. So an osteotomy, this is how we've always done it in the past, um, up until very recently. It's considered the gold standard, so that means it's how, how we've done it to fix it. It's what everything is compared to. Um, again, there's a lot of procedures described for this, um, and essentially what you're doing is you're cutting that long bone called the metatarsal, and you're realigning it. So you're just changing the direction of it, and where you make the cut and how much of a cut you make will depend on the amount of correction that you need, so how bad is your bunion. We can also cut the big toe itself, that's called an Aiken, and that is also done in combination with other osteotomies in the foot. So here you can see in this x-ray, this is an example of an osteotomy, the big, that big long bone, the metatarsal, it's crooked, but you can see that the foot is straight. So the osteotomy makes the metatarsal crooked, but it straightens out the toe. The problem with the osteotomy is that 
there is a relatively high recurrence rate. There was one study that said that it was a 70% recurrence rate in some way, but it's probably actually closer to about 15 to 20% if you look at all studies. Most people are satisfied with the osteotomy, about 80%, but about half of people still have pain after this surgical procedure, and more than half still had some type of shoe wear difficulty. Part of the problem with the osteotomy with the, with the higher recurrence rate and maybe the lower satisfaction rate is that we were potentially trying to correct a three-dimensional problem with a two-dimensional answer. So we were trying to correct rotation with just cutting the bone in one plane and just kind of realigning everything. And so that got us more into like an arthrodesis setting, which is a fusion. Now this is the original fusion and it's called a, a, a lapidus. And we're trying to fuse the joints in the middle of your foot called your tarso metatarsal joint. Um, and the, the lapidus was typically referred to, or sorry, um, was typically reserved for when that joint was hypermobile or painful. So if we examined it and there was a lot of motion, because that joint doesn't typically move a lot, um, or it was really painful with motion, then we would fuse that joint. And that's how we would correct the uh, deformity. It traditionally had pretty good success rate, but again, the, the indications were limited. Sometimes we can also fuse the, uh, the joint that moves the big toe itself, um, called your metatarsal phalangeal joint, and that was, that's reserved usually if people have really bad arthritis of that joint in combination with the bunion. So like I was saying earlier, you know, maybe part of the problem was that a bunion is actually a three-dimensional problem. So it's a rotational issue that we were trying to correct with a two-dimensional um, surgery. And so the lapoplasty, or a generically a frontal plane correction, relies on recorrect or uh, derotating this deformity to straighten out the bone and then fusing the joint where the problem is arising from. So it's basically an update of the old lapidus procedure. And you're making small cuts in the bone with a, with a guide that's placed over the joint. Um, you're removing these small chunks of the joint and then you're bringing the two ends of the bone together and fusing that joint. So you're rotating everything around and then fusing the joint to hold it in place. And we're using plates and screws. You can combine this with that osteotomy that I talked about earlier, the Aiken, which is where you cut the big toe to help correct some more of the deformity. Um, but it does a great job of correcting the deformity. And uh, if we go to the right next slide, there is a, a good animation showing that just wrote, so what they're doing here is they're just rotating the base of that bone. And you can see those two, the M&Ms that Dr. Summerhays was talking about. You can see that they rotate back underneath into their natural orientation and that the bone straightens back out. So that's where the, the, um, the thought process behind the lapoplasty came from was you're just rotating this bone. Um, the problem with the lapoplasty right now is that it's new. So um, the osteotomies have been around for a long time. We know the complication rates. We know how to counsel patients. We know how they're gonna do. With the lapoplasty, we don't have a ton of data. It's very limited. Um, there's no long-term data and there's not really any significant patient reported outcome data on it. Now, early data is promising. So we can compare the early data like one and two year outcomes to old osteotomy studies that looked at one and two year outcomes. And we know that the recurrence rate is lower. It's about 3%. And that there's a higher rate of fusion of that joint than the traditional lapoplasty. It's about 96%, at least in a, the most recent study published on it. It also has the benefit of allowing earlier weight bearing. So people will weight bear immediately after this procedure. Whereas in the past, it was you know, four to six weeks before we let you really start to walk. And so that is uh, definitely a benefit of this procedure, but it's something that you have to consider. It, it's new. Uh, and while it does appear to work very well, we don't have all the data to know how it's gonna do long-term down the road. And so here is a, you know, a representation of how you would correct it on the left you can see that they have a, uh, a bunion. They've got the, the metatarsal is turned towards the inside or more further left of the screen and the big toe is starting to turn out. 
And on the right is after surgical correction. You can see how straight that bone is. That angle, that peace sign that Dr. Summerhays was talking about before has reduced and the big toe is straight and those uh, M&Ms, the sesamoids are underneath the metatarsal head. And you can see here is that um, sesamoid view on the x-ray and this is before on the left surgical correction, you can see that they're rotated. And this is that same patient from earlier. You can see that they are rotated out. And then on the right is after surgical correction, they're, they're perfectly back in their grooves um, after rotation of that bone. And so after surgery, if uh, typically you can start to put some weight down within the first few days after surgery, and you walk in a boot for about four to six weeks. After that, we start to transition you into more comfortable shoes. And most people are back to normal activities and wearing um, uh, normal shoes by about four to six months. Now there is some variation there. If we're doing other procedures like uh, hammer toes are common with bunions. And if we're correcting hammer toes or doing other things that may modify this post-operative recovery course. But if you're just getting a bunion correction, especially through the, uh, uh, the lapoplasty, then this is the regimen that you would follow for recovery. So um, that, that's it for the presentation. And we really appreciate everybody who came and listened. Uh, if there are any questions, we would be happy to answer them. Yeah, I will jump back in now. Uh, like you said, if you do have questions, you can use, it's a Q&A button. So it should be at the bottom of your screen and you'll have to type those questions in, but we can answer uh, any questions that you have. Uh, there were a few that were pre-submitted, so I'll go ahead and ask some of those now. Um, Let's see, are these surgeries inpatient or outpatient procedures? So uh, at least for me, and I think for both of these guys, it's an outpatient surgery. How painful is a bunion correction surgery? Uh, pain's hard to judge. So pain is pretty subjective. People respond to it differently, um, but most people, at least most of my patients, tolerate the procedure very well. Um, there's a lot of things that we do before and after surgery to help with pain, like blocks um, and certain and other pain control methods. Um, but most of my patients have tolerated it very well. Okay. What, what about you, Fial and some rays? Yeah, it's usually, uh, I tell patients probably the first two to three days will be probably the most un uh, uncomfortable. Um, usually by day three, uh, you know, things are, are improving quite a bit. So, um, so, you know, and everybody's different. So there are some patients who do great and we never hear anything. They take a pain medicine for a day or two and that's it. And there are some who really have issues and that's just kind of, uh, people in nature, but overall it's, it's something that's very tolerable, tolerable. And uh, it is an outpatient procedure, uh, for, for me as well. Everybody's different and everybody tolerates it different. Um, and, uh, you know, I personally had them, uh, my big toes worked on and, um, you know, it, it's, it's bone soreness. It's a different soreness, but, um, yeah, it, it's a very tolerable, um, usually for most people. Great. Well, we got some questions submitted just now. Someone asked, how does hammer toe surgery affect success and time to recovery? Uh, it definitely changes things a little bit. So hammer toes are a completely kind of different animal onto themselves. Um, sometimes they behave very well and, and sometimes they, they can they could be an issue. So as far as recovery goes, it, it won't change the recovery at all. Um, you know, it's still the same time frame that Dr. Schrazer had, had laid out. You, you're looking at four to six weeks as, of being in a walking boot. Um, and so the biggest issue that I, I see with patients with hammer toes is uh, swelling. Um, that's probably the number one uh, complaint or issues that patients have is that the, the toes will stay swollen for a long time. And that is, you know, uncomfortable and, um, and patients don't like that. But as, as far as if you look at three months, six months uh, out from surgery, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't affect recovery at all. Hammer toes and bunion surgery. Um, are very common to have in combination. Um, and everybody's feet are different and even within the same person, they could have two separate feet and uh, the more procedures that you add in there, um, that means the deformity or the problem that they have to start with uh, is more intense. And so kind of the more surgery that somebody has, the more that it's gonna be sore, the more swelling they're gonna have and then how important it is to elevate and ice and take it easy afterwards and follow directions 
um, by your surgeon as much as possible. Um, it's when, when patients don't follow directions that they take a longer time to recover or have issues that they might have not had to have, so. Great. Another question we just had submitted is how long is the surgery itself? Surgery typically takes anywhere between about an hour to maybe hour and a half. Um, every once in a while, again, if we're doing other things, let's you know say there, there's a hammer toe in there or whatnot, you know, maybe you're looking at two hours, but I would say 90, 95% of it is probably within an hour to hour and a half. And after surgery, can you typically return to sports such as tennis or basketball? That really depends on the on. I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into that. If you, um, you know, a high level competitive athlete, um, you would have to caution them that there would be some potential loss in push off strength and things like that. But for most people who just want to go back and play kind of recreational sports, um, uh, yeah, you can go back to that. Okay. Yeah, it takes time. So I think that's, you know, what I always counsel patients on is it's, it's a, it's a process, you know, it's not at six weeks, you know, you're, you're definitely not back to, to where you were before surgery. So I think, you know, in something like that, you know, it's, it's kind of a walk before run kind of a mentality. So you want to be able to make sure that you can do the normal day to day stuff uh, well without any issue before you start going into that more higher impact activity. But um, you know, they're, you know, vast majority of patients are able to get back and do exactly what they were doing before. So if you were really big into basketball, absolutely, you can do that. If you were into running, you can do that too. But the question is, is the time frame on that. So, and that's where everybody's different. So I always tell patients, maybe three to six months, you're looking at that. And then maybe, you know, if the things are just going slow, you know, nine months to a year um, to really, really get back to that high level, high function activity. But if everything goes well, there's usually no reason why you shouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I typically allow you to start progressing your activities as you tolerate by three months um, with a kind of a start slow, go slow type thing in terms of trying out more and more exercises as you go. But it does take, you know, I agree about six months to really get back to that pre-operative level of function. Now, you may be walking without pain and starting to do more exercises between that six weeks and 12 weeks period, but um, to really kind of get back and recover what you've lost by being down for that time and kind of get over the swelling of surgery and, and kind of get used to everything else, it does take some time. All right, we had another person ask, based on potential for development of arthritis due to misalignment of bones, does it make sense to do surgery sooner rather than later, or when should you do that? It's still the point of you want something, you know, it should be painful, like Dr. Schweizer had talked about uh, in his portion, but typically the earlier you are and the earlier on that you can um, realign the foot uh, is always gonna be better because as that big toe keeps coming over, it keeps pushing into your second toe that second toe is going to likely have to go up in the air or it just starts to rub. And that's why the development of hammer toes is, is increased with the bunion. Uh, and so stabilizing that earlier is usually always better. How much of a loss of range of motion should people expect from surgery? Like would they still be able to flex the foot, do lunges, that sort of thing? Yeah, that, that joint normally doesn't move a whole lot anyway. Um, so if that's the only joint, the, so say you're getting the, and right now we're talking about like the lapoplasty procedure or the frontal plane correction. So that joint doesn't move a whole lot. And so most people don't notice any significant stiffness um, or any other change in their motion. Now, sometimes you have some associated arthritis with your big toe joint um, and that you can lose some motion on. But um, most of the time, it's not any different than what you had before surgery. You know, I, we can't, can't tell you that it's going to get better after surgery because you have contractures and, um, uh, and things like that, especially if you have arthritis. But in terms of loss of motion, most people don't notice much of any difference. 
you know, you're stabilizing the foot more with that procedure. But like Dr. Schweitzer was talking about with the big toe joint, that joint in a lot of people sits somewhat out of the socket and then putting it back in the socket, sometimes they might feel some wear and tear in the joint. And that's why we always have them work with range of motion and other things afterwards. Do bunions and hammer toes tend to continue to get worse? Uh, let's see, after age 70, is age a factor or not? It's somewhat, I mean, they are progressive by nature. So if we follow, follow this over a long period of time, so let's say we're 20, 25, you know, your toes uh, are gonna look a lot different at 50. So we do know that, uh, you know, it is gonna change over time, but we can't, we can't predict how, how bad that's gonna be, how quickly that's gonna be. All we know is that they do, over a period of time, it's, it's, gonna, be, uh, it's gonna be worse than what it is currently. So, um, you know, as far as like, you know, is there gonna, are you gonna see a big difference at 70 to 80? Probably not. Um, but, you know, if you're 25 and, and you're looking at your feet at 70, there's gonna be a difference. All right. Could bunion surgery prevent arthritis in the bunion toe from getting worse? Um, I think so. You know, this kind of goes all along with the um, with the previous one. Will it get worse? So if you don't correct your bunion, was was so if you have a symptomatic bunion or a bunion in general, and you, and you don't correct it, it will likely get worse over time in terms of the deformity. And as if you have the, as the deformity gets worse, you have a higher chance of generating or getting more arthritis in that big in the joint for your big toe because the joint is no longer aligned. And so you have abnormal contact pressure between the two ends of the joint, which wears the cartilage out. Um, but uh, something that I always tell my patients is that while the deformity might get worse, we can't predict whether you'll whether your symptoms will get worse. So x-ray, people can come in with horrible looking x-rays, but they don't really have any pain. Um, and some people come in with just kind of mild x-rays, but they have a lot of pain. So we can't really predict, you know, if your symptoms will get worse. We know that the deformity will, and if the deformity gets worse, your risk of arthritis increases, but, you know, we don't know if you'll become symptomatic uh, from that. And to follow up on that, uh, they're also asking, it sounds like we have a runner here who has a bunion and um, it has caused a stress fracture in the past. So would surgery or taking care of the bunion help prevent future stress fractures or can we tell that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, Dr. Summer has touched on this a little bit earlier. It's kind of like the, the analogy of the, the tires on your car are out of alignment. So uh, the longer that that goes, that's gonna, that's gonna change the wear pattern on your tires, that's gonna change how your car functions. And I very much view the, the foot as like a tripod. And so you've got like, you guys can see or whatever, you've got kind of three legs of support. You've got like your big toe, your little toe, and then your heel. And what I tell patients is, is uh, when you have a bunion, that's like your tripod becomes kind of unstable or it's like a chair that you sit in where like one leg is shorter or longer than the other. So you kind of, you teeter back and forth. And so um, with like stress fractures, so what's really common with bunions is you start transferring that weight over to like the second toe or the third toe or those metatarsals, those bones behind it. So, so you know, in theory, if you can stabilize this joint that we've been talking about, you kind of rebalance that foot and your tripod um, becomes more stable. And so in theory, maybe that's taking more weight and pressure off of those areas and, and reducing the risk of a stress fracture. But there's a lot of things that go into why patients get a stress fracture. Um, and so it could be, again, multifactorial and based on a lot of other things, not just the alignment and the mechanics of it. Is there any reason you'd advise someone with bunions against corrective surgery? Yeah, if they're not having pain. That's a simple answer. <laughs> Let's see, someone else asked, uh, about how far out are you currently scheduling surgery? It's kind of season and time dependent. Um, with with uh, 
surgeries, it's it's not one that takes months to get scheduled. Typically, that that's one that you know, a few weeks to a month or two. Uh, so. Yeah, and we still all, still are operating with COVID, and we definitely have things in place as far as uh, social distancing uh, standards, and and we are you know making sure the clinic is is disinfected, and and we are wearing masks and all of that. So uh, we haven't you know there was about a month there where we weren't really doing a lot of surgery, but since May uh, we have been operating uh, as usual. So and. Uh, you know, as, as far as Dr. Summerhay says, it's a, probably a few weeks or so as far as being booked out, and it takes time, and we definitely would want to get patients into the clinic and meet face-to-face -face and get x-rays and all the things that we have done, and sometimes we need to do some more preoperative stuff just to make sure that we have all of our, our ducks in a row for surgery, so, but it, it's not, it's not one of these that takes a big amount of time to, to schedule, so we can usually kind of plug, plug these in uh, throughout our schedule. Yeah, and clinic appointments are, um, you know, not, uh, they're set up in such a way where we're not trying to keep a, a bunch of people in the waiting room. You know, we want to try to have people come in uh, socially distance, um, wearing a mask and everybody else wearing a mask and uh, coming into clinic and having your evaluation um, and, and seeing that and being able to, to move that big toe and, and see what our problem area is and, um, and then um, having to head out and, you know, uh, nice, safe, socially distance. Sounds good. And I know we talked about causes at the beginning of the presentation, but is there anything that people can do at home uh, to avoid the problem in the first place, or at least to avoid surgery? Wear shoes that fit properly. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, there's a lot of patients have come in and they'll ask and you know, they saw saw this thing on the internet. You know, this this magical miracle brace, or they they read somewhere where you do these stretches that that's going to correct it, and uh, that's usually not the case. So our, you know, like Dr. Schwazer had said, our our treatment is essentially uh, you know the kind of the conservative no surgery uh, road or their surgery, and the conservative and the the non operative uh, pathway is just trying to manage symptoms. So. If it's because your shoes are too tight and it rubs against that prominence, then you know our suggestion is is wear wider shoes or just be very aware, cognizant of the shoes that you select. Um, or if it's it's irritation, there's over the counter pads that you can go over to you know to help with that. So, um, but there's not anything that you can do to to prevent it. So once it's there, it's there, and it's either can you live with it or is it symptomatic enough where it's really painful that it it hurts, it's impacting your function, your ability to do the things that you want to do. Um, and to where you, you know, nothing else has helped and it's, you know, surgery is, is what you're looking at. Now of the different types of surgery you mentioned, is one of them the most common treatment? Um, osteotomies are still probably the most common if you look at every, like in general. Um, and now which type of osteotomy, like I said, there's a lot and a lot of it has to do with surgeon preference. Um, I would say more people are moving a little bit towards the laparoplasty or the, at least some type of frontal plane correction. Um, it's what I typically do a lot of. Um, but if you look at like America or the world in general, it's probably still osteotomies. All right. And I know people always want to know, uh, will insurance cover this surgery? So that's why uh, painful problematic bunion um, is something that's important to when even thinking about a surgery, but it's a, a surgery that's elective, meaning that you choose as long as it's appropriate when to do that. It's not a cosmetic surgery and it's not one like Dr. Schweizer had talked about. We don't just do bunion surgery because you don't like the look of your foot. It's about the function and trying to help that alignment and balancing the foot out like uh, the tripod, like Dr. Fial had mentioned as well. Yeah, but for, for the insurance question, um, you know, that's up to financial services, but pretty much uh, at least most um, commercial carriers will cover whatever surgery, um, you know, but in terms of patient responsibility and all that stuff, I, that would be up to financial services. But it's a, it is a, you know, a surgery that is covered by insurance in general. All right. 
Well, that is all the questions I'm seeing right now. Uh, is there anything we missed that you wanted to touch on before we wrap things up? No, thanks uh, for coming, everybody. We appreciate it. Sounds Thank good. You. And once again, to uh, request an appointment, you can go to muhelp.org slash bunion. That's that website right there. And thank you everyone for being here today and tuning in. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Mayor.